Mr. Wheeler, okay, I'll let you take the floor. You're here to talk about the machine, right? Uh, in part, yes, sir. All right, well, good. Well, welcome to the stage. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Oh, yeah, I will need that. This, uh, let's see if we can get the notes section on the other one. Perfect. Oh, there it was. Uh, anyway, while that's coming up, uh, this is my first CBIT Global Conference, and uh, I can only say, wow, what an impressive event. Let's see if we can get it. No, go back. Uh, still working on this monitor, if we can. Anyway, while they're still working on that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, to get things started, I believe it's fair to say that technology has delivered tremendous benefits for all of us. Now, with that in mind, technology does have its limitations, and while it's opened our eyes to things that we couldn't even imagine that were possible 60 years ago, uh, it has its limitations, and so what I want to do today is share with you a little bit about uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises' Uh, perception or perspective on the future of computing and specifically the challenges we think the world is facing and our opportunities to change. So, true artificial intelligence, intergalactic travel and exploration, and yes, even a cure for cancer. At one point in time, those goals, each one of those goals was seen as being out of reach. But now, with advancements in the fields of science and technology, we've seen radical progress towards each and every one of those. And the gap between bringing a concept from idea to reality is diminishing, whether in business or society at large. And as our world becomes more intertwined with technology, Digital transformation is reshaping every sector, from large enterprise to the healthcare industry itself. So, as proof of this digital transformation, you just need to look how sectors have been transformed and are being transformed. So, just a couple of examples that have, uh, I think, just transpired during our own professional careers, as far as that time span goes, uh, you know, you look at print media, think about, you know, the changes that we've seen there. Think about how you consume uh, entertainment today, whether it's music, uh, streaming video, television, you name it. Uh, so, a lot, of, a lot of change there. Or think about the sectors that are being disrupted before our very eyes. Uh, if you think about the smart city initiatives, you look at how agriculture is done, you know, even transportation, you know, all of those are things that are in flight. But this isn't just about disruption, it's about, it's about creating new business opportunities uh, for enterprises of every type, size, and level of maturity. So what do these possibilities bring us? Well, let's take healthcare as an example. So, for various reasons, I personally don't know a lot about my own genealogical or kind of family medical history. So, recently, I, uh, I submitted a sample to one of those genetic testing services. And just the, you know, the simple analytics that they run and provide back to you really get you thinking about the possibilities when it comes to healthcare. So, what if we could look at a patient's entire medical history? Uh, if we took all of their data, we took uh, all of the data from, you know, maybe a wearable that, th that they have, and we take all of the records of, you know, say 100 people in the world that are most like them. Think about the insights and predictions that you could drive off of that. Now, uh, there's an obvious data privacy uh, concern there that I think one of our speakers later this afternoon will, will, will also speak to and share. Uh, but uh, I think that is something, if we're cognizant of it, uh, that is something that can be managed. 
so also think of the possibilities for finding treatments that uh, we just simply can't see today once we have access to all that data. Think of all the possibilities for diagnosing rare diseases. And this even speaks directly to our collaboration that we have for uh, the German Center for Neurogenic Diseases. So uh, we've joined a collaboration with them. They've seen what we're doing, interested in uh, kind of this new memory-driven compute model that we have so that they can do further study on the brain and how it maps to, uh, to diseases that they are, they're working on as well. And then finally, just think about all the possibilities for well-being. Think about our overall health and longevity that we can achieve by connecting a world of health information that can be synthesized for the specific individual. So what's holding us back? Why can't we do all of this today? Well, we'll start with the information itself. So we are rapidly chasing a world in which everything computes. Uh, I know probably all heard a little bit about data explosion, so here's kind of my take on it. By 2020, IDC is projecting that uh, there will be 20 billion connected things, 100 billion social infrastructures, and over a trillion applications, all for about 8 billion people in the world. And uh, just as a little sample size, get everyone participating here. So if you've got at least one connected device on your body today, raise your hand. How about two or more? Okay, so pretty good. So as another data point, uh, our Aruba networking group recently uh, redid the campus infrastructure for one of the major U.S. universities. And what they found is they started to scale things out and size how many waypoints were needed and, you know, where, how many radios were required, all of that. They sampled the, the current freshman class. And what they found is the average freshman brings to campus 10 devices, 10 connected devices. So you can see right there, even with that alone, we're well on our way to the 20 billion. Now, as all of these things become data points, uh, what we're going to see is we will exponentially increase our network of information. This means billions of devices, things and assets to connect, manage, and realize in real time with much greater precision than what we do today. So, just think, as another example, let's say we have a fleet of autonomous vehicles. So, those vehicles on the road, if a sudden stop has to occur, there's just a split second of time, and we're going to be in a situation where we, we can't simply, we can't tolerate the latency required to push all of that data up to a central location in the cloud and get the response back. Uh, you know, so we need that need and demand that, that real-time responsiveness. But so in a world where everything computes, where we're more connected than we already are, the computing systems we rely on will not be able to keep up. That's kind of a major point. Another trend that's holding us back is the fact that the computer hardware essentially stopped getting better a while ago. So, we've talked a little bit about uh, the data explosion, but in fact, if you look at the graph there on the left, you'll see that every two years, we double the amount of information, that it, or amount of data, at least, that is produced. So, we call this the, the, the digital universe. So, another way of saying this is, if you look back in history, okay, in just two years, we will have replicated the amount of everything that was created beforehand. So that talks to the data growth, and then the problem of extracting useful information out of that becomes, you know, essentially part of the challenge. So uh, data explosion, that part of the problem is getting, getting bigger, getting harder. On the right side, though, you can see uh, this graph shows how microprocessor import, uh, in performance improvement 
since the dawn of Moore's Law, how, what that looks like over time. Now, for the non-technologists in the room, Moore's Law is simply the observation that says eh, every 12 to 18 months, we've been able to double the number of transistors that we can fit on an integrated circuit. So, in many ways, that's really been responsible for how we've kept pace with the explosion in data to date. But kind of the, uh, the bad side of this and what we're seeing now is those productivity gains are beginning to flatten out. So as the orange line on the very top shows, we can foresee an end to Moore's Law if things don't change. That means that steady... Uh, steady kind of track record of getting more performance at roughly the same cost and, uh, and power and uh, is, is we're, we're seeing that flatten out. So uh, all of this really means that the end of this silicon scaling and the performance we get from that is happening at just the wrong time. So what does all of this mean? Computing technology has evolved with need, but it's still based on the same fundamental uh, architecture that we've had in place for more than 60 years. So as we look back over time, uh, we can see that it really started with what I call systems of record. So this was really about logging information, so bookkeeping, accounting, uh, essentially creating an electronic version of something that we kept on paper record. So this is where the whole kind of idea of transaction processing really came into being. Now, we've since migrated to what I call interactive applications or systems of engagement. So think about social media. Think about how you engage with things like Facebook and, and Twitter. Uh, so these applications required new ways of handling what I call messy data, okay? So it's not a pure transaction. Uh, so while new innovation came online with that, it's still supported really by the same underlying framework of infrastructure that was built for the transactional use, okay? We are now moving into a new phase, we call this systems of action. So if you want a smart grid, for example, well, it needs to operate at the speed of a, of a, you know, a Google search, but with the accuracy and reliability of the transactional system. Uh, on a Google search today, if that fails uh, or something happens on the back end, it's like, ah, oh, well, no big deal. I'll just try it again. Um, with, this, with this new system of action, we've got to be just as robust as a transactional system to really make this work. So, right, if you think about machine learning, you think about some of these other applications, these require new systems that are designed for action versus simply recording. So, we're experiencing this perfect storm in which our 60-year-old computer architecture simply won't work. We've got more data, while new technology demands such as, you know, real-time response requirements and our existing legacy computer principles, just like Moore's Law, are falling flat. So what we need is we need a new solution to the future. So we're at this inflection point, and if we don't innovate, things will stagnate, uh, computing will get more expensive, we'll be limited in what we can do. If we do keep pushing forward, really believe sky is the limit here. Now, this isn't going to happen tomorrow. I'm not going to be a doomsday person up here uh, because we do have great technology in place now and we've got plenty uh, that's in current development. But my point is, without changing, as a society, we may fail to realize new opportunities and drive new advancements. So, the good news for all of us is that more than 10 years ago, uh, within Hewlett Packard Labs, we began working on the architectural principles for a new solution. And we call it memory driven computing. So, this is fundamentally a rethink in basic computer architecture. 
This isn't a new application or even the, you know, simple integration, not that it's simple, but integration of things like accelerators or, you know, quantum computing. Uh, it moves much more beyond the evolutionary nature. So, rather, this is a reinvention of the foundation of technology, which is, has the potential, really, to underpin things at every scale, from massive data center scale, supercomputers, and to what we call computing at the edge. So the opportunity it presents is that it enables a massive and essential leap forward to eliminate the constraints of today's computing architecture and harness the power of data in ways that are not possible today. So we want to realize the true possibility of artificial intelligence, intergalactic travel, and hopefully help us advance toward solutions for some of our biggest challenges, even like curing cancer. So here's a very simple view of what memory-driven computing is at its core. So kind of the graphic on the left is really how today's computers are assembled. So they, um, they're allocated, so the data itself is allocated uh, based on what the processor will allow. So the processor essentially acts as a gatekeeper to your memory or your, da or your data set. Now, the most recent challenge in computer architecture has been trying to size that memory subsystem to, to meet the demands of the compute. So memory has always been the scarce resource, at least for the last 20, 30 years of developing systems. Our shift turns the conventional computer inside out. So memory-driven computing puts memory or your data Okay, at the center of everything and allows you to overcome the limitations of the processor so that I can scale things independently, I can bring different processing technologies as they evolve independently to work on the problem. So this is going to unlock an unprecedented level, unprecedented level of performance for us uh, as well as major efficiency gains. Okay? So... Yeah, bottom line, with this architecture, you can ingest, store, and manipulate truly massive data sets while simultaneously achieving multiple orders of magnitude with less energy per bit. So, what does this deliver, and how do we envision, and what do we envision as the end state? First, we believe this architecture is fast and powerful. It dramatically increases speed of processing by removing a lot of the current layers that exist in today's software stack. You can kind of think of this as, as removing the middleman in data processing. And for those that uh, can make it to our booth, we actually have uh, some demonstrations kind of running, and I can walk uh, through this in much more detail with you. Next, it's both secure and smart. So security is embedded at every level of the system. One of the big things we have the opportunity to do with this architecture is, you know, security within the computer industry, it's always been a bolt-on kind of exercise over the years. We've, you know, as new threats have come on board, we've figured out how to patch things or, you know, we've, we've done the best we can, but, you know, honestly, we're losing, uh, losing a battle there. Uh, with this architecture, again, we've built security in all the way from the silicon up with things like encrypting data both at rest and at transit. Uh, so those two elements right there, truly revolutionary based on what we do today. Finally, it's open and simple. We want this memory-driven dr compute architecture uh, we want this really entire ecosystem to be an open architecture. We want as many industry players uh, to come in and participate as possible. And as one proof point of that, all of the open source, all of the software work we've done, all the API development, we've released all of that to the open source community where anyone can pick up, contribute, and take advantage of it. So, where are we in terms of actually realizing this architecture? Well, last November, we announced that we had successfully demonstrated the world's first memory-driven computing architecture. 
This is actually a picture of the node board that we have uh, over in Hall 4 in the demo area. And so this was a huge milestone for us because it really uh, demonstrated the ability for us to collapse the memory and the interconnects in a fundamentally different way. Now, while this development was a, was a huge kind of existence point or proof point of our research, it really set a lot of things in motion for us. First thing it did is it allowed us to bring elements of this research, uh, such as the photonic interconnect, which allows us to communicate with light instead of, uh, you know, copper-based elect electronics. It allows that, allowed us to move that particular asset into our current roadmap, and we, we think about uh, how to take advantage of that individual piece. Uh, now that we also have this up and running, all of the simulation work that we've been doing, it's allowing us to correlate those results and really kind of assess improved ex execution speeds and really validate and help us uh, tweak what we're doing here. And finally, it's helping us expand our eff efforts towards exascale computing. Now, I want to make a few notes about exascale computing. Uh, because it's a developing area of high-performance computing, and it aims to create computers that are several orders of magnitude more powerful than we, what we have today. Now, the great thing about our memory-driven computing architecture is that it is incredibly scalable all the way from, you know, that edge IoT device all the way up to that exascale level of computing. So it really does make it the ideal foundation for a wide range of, of emerging high-performance computing uh, workloads, as well as data-intensive workloads like, like big data. So going back to our test bed or the prototype, what results have we seen thus far? Well, the short answer is we've, we've seen a lot. And the way to think about, or the way to kind of read this graphic and the way I explain it is the performance improvements we're seeing uh, really start from, on one hand, just maybe modifying existing frameworks. So with very little uh, modification to the application itself, what kind of speed ups can we hope to, to achieve? And then from there, uh, really the story gets better and better, okay? If you're willing to think about new algorithms, uh, you're going to start to see speed ups that are even more impressive. And then if you can completely rethink how things are done to really exploit the advantages of the architecture, then that's where the biggest advantages um, kind of come from. So uh, kind of starting back on modifying existing frameworks, one example we have here is the work that we've done with Spark. Now, Spark, for those that know, is one of the leading open source tools to do in-memory analytics on a cluster of just, you know, commodity servers. And so we had a related research project that looked at, well, what if we take that concept of Spark and, and how it is kind of uh, uh, distributed today, what if we just simply apply some of the uh, memory-driven concepts we have uh, within Spark itself? And so just by modifying a couple of hundred lines of code from the base distribution, we were able to achieve speed ups of over 15 times what, what we were seeing on current platforms. So that's, not, that's just purely talking about uh, the software side. So no new hardware, no new architecture beyond just this mindset of now, you know, trying to collapse that, that uh, memory storage hierarchy. Uh, another example kind of on the existing framework is around uh, similarity search. This is another demonstration we have uh, running in our booth area. But, you know, another really, I guess, fundamental kind of computer science application today, um, you know, that we use for things like image, image search, uh, genomics research. Uh, again, it's used kind of for a number of things. And, again, given that onslaught of data, this problem is really outpacing a lot of the supercomputer development that we have today. Uh, and so we've seen some tremendous speed up uh, on that application uh, as well. Now, the next phase, kind of start thinking about new algorithms. 
Uh, one exciting area we've done a lot of work on, and again, have contributed a lot to the open source community, is around graphs. So, and graphs increasingly represent the connected world, the random connected world that we have today. And so, graph inference is how you make predictions using just a small amount of a known data set. And uh, so, similarity search and graph inference, those are two of the demos, again, that we, that we have running that we can show you more about. Uh, and then finally, you can, you can get up to, okay, what, how do I rethink about really uh, taking full advantage of this architecture? And financial modeling is an example of this. So uh, financial modeling using something like Monte Carlo simulation is used to predict things like derivative pricing and uh, to be able to assess risk on a portfolio. So these are just a few of the basic numbers uh, and what's possible of what can be achieved if you start to rethink and can maybe uh, do away with some of the layers of some of the software assumptions that have been built up over the last 60 years. Now, I want to look at that uh, financial modeling example just a little closer. So, global markets are never stable. So, changes occur instantaneously and they lead to risk and unforeseen losses. To manage this, the financial industry uses complex modeling uh, that's computed through very computationally uh, expensive simulation, such as Monte Carlo analysis. Now, most of the time, at best, maybe this recompute is done once, once an evening, maybe at best a couple of times a day, okay? So we ran a simulation to assess how we could use the advancements of memory-driven computing to get accurate financial risk estimates faster, therefore reducing risk, and we saw some incredible outcomes. So using the concept of graph inference and the ability of the architecture to all work on the same problem that's resident in memory, uh, we saw some dramatic speed up in terms of uh, the improvement and in, in ability to price an option or uh, reduce, uh, reduce our risk. So, by being able to go from hours to seconds to model a, fin a financial instrument really changes the way people do business. Speed is money. Accuracy is big money. So, again, this is another demonstration we have running, uh, and I encourage you to come by and take a look at that. Now, it's important to note that the same techniques uh, that, that, that we use to, you know, do these type of transforms, uh, you know, can also be applied to things like utility systems, uh, you know, transportation. You know, there are a number of, I would say, adjacent uh, markets where this applies. The bottom line is it allows us to be informed of the best possible decision in the time when it still matters, basically before the opportunity gets away from us. Again, that it kind of keeps it coming back to this real-time response, this real-time analysis of the data that we have in hand. Now, let me bring this, take this all back to the beginning uh, and talk about the healthcare aspect again. So, Again, if we think about current, you know, state-of-the-art on current medical diagnostics, it's really being constrained by being compared to the average patient, right? That's, that's how the system kind of works. So you look at the average patient, you kind of, you know, you've got your background knowledge of the systems, and then you come up with, well, okay, here's, here's maybe a pres prescription for what we do. You know, what if we could look beyond the symptoms to examine the health records at every level that's available to us to really get to that root cause. We believe memory-driven computing can enable doctors and specialists to see patterns in new ways to predict disease and accurately diagnose it right away. It can run near-infinite permutations of very complex data sets. And one day, Hope to even see that we can stop certain illnesses 
for, forever happening to begin with. You know, that was part of my own reasoning for doing the testing I did. You know, I, on one hand, I wanted to know, am I susceptible to something? You know, even the, you know, I think the service I did had uh, maybe 80 different traits that it maps. Now, you know, it's, it's valuable to know if I'm prone to, you know, the, the unibrow syndrome, which I am, so that's good to know. Uh, but I also want to know, you know, am I susceptible to other things? Uh, and I haven't really decided for myself, is there a point where I really don't want to know? But uh, I think as individuals, we'd certainly, like, we'd certainly like having that option, okay? Uh, so, in many ways, uh, the bottom line is we believe this architecture uh, as applied to healthcare, can make us all data scientists. Uh, we want to bring vast pools of information to our fingertips so that we can find answers uh, that sometimes we didn't even know we were looking for. So, in closing, technology has brought us really a lot of great things. And while it has its limitations and its challenges, I prefer to believe that the best is yet to come. And just think, 60 years from now, just think where we could be. So, thank you. We've got, we've got time. Okay, for one it. or two questions? Yeah, Great. exactly. It looks like you've mastered your unibrow, yeah, I've by the way. Yeah, care of. <laughs> okay, any questions from the audience? It's near lunchtime. It gets hard yeah, to get. It, ah, there we go. We've got a win. Where, did, did someone have their... Right here. Uh, I would like to thank you. That was uh, really an uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, going back to the, to the explosion in information need and that the Moore's Law is no longer working and your choice of uh, having a memory-centric uh, architecture. Uh, from my recollection, the advancement in processing was was better than the enhancement than the advancement in performance in memory access. For example, dynamic memory has been and always be very slow, and also static memory is uh, is better. How how did you ch you know treat this uh, gap between memory performance and your need? Yeah, really. Well, two things. Great. Great observation. You're absolutely right on uh, the rate at which memory has progressed relative to processing. Absolutely correct on that. Um, short answer, and would love to spend some more time with you going through a few more details. But the, one of the big breakthroughs is, again, trying to really decouple memory from an individual processor, right? Today, it's a fixed ratio. So one thing we, we did is by bringing a memory fabric or a memory interconnect into the architecture, the way to think of it is we can essentially, uh, you know, boot or bring online memory separate from the amount of processing. That way, we bring and attach to it whatever processing we see fit to match a particular workload. So... Uh, that enables, uh, that enables us to really balance out the amount of bandwidth that's there as well as the capacity and compute capability. Short answer. Great question. Which I was going to ask you, when the computers aren't falling on the floor, <laughs> are, this brave new world, this machine, is it actually going to change the physicality of computers? Uh, I, be I believe it will. So... Certainly, if you think about the integration level of all of these individual technologies, that'll make all of our smartphones, laptops, even better, faster, cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. That's the simple part. But if you think at the data center scale, right, where you've got thousands of servers today spread across hundreds of thousands of square feet of floor space, uh, a lot of the innovations we are, we are bringing will allow us to, you know, Physically, uh, how we build things will be completely different because with something like a photonic interconnect, it allows me now to spread things out differently. I can, you know, my energy management is different for how I cool things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it enables a lot more flexibility than what we have today. Uh, 
So why aren't we there yet? I mean, you're, the idea seems feasible. So what's standing in the way of going to the point that you describe in your presentation? I think it's really been, uh, first of all... <laughs> well, gravity <laughs> is definitely working on this stage, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You know, within the enterprise, look, we know everything. And in some respects, things are moving at blinding speed. But, you know, kind of on the, the IT infrastructure level, things, some things actually move pretty slowly. When you think about how diverse the ecosystem is, the number of, of hardware and software manufacturers that pour into that, all of the ISVs, so it really does take time. So even this kind of this trend of Moore's Law, you know, it's a little bit slower than, say, the consumer side where everyone kind of sees it coming. We know we need to do things. Okay, let's all get together. We need to work on some new standards to do things or, or a new API and, 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 and to take advantage of it. Um, so that's, that's part of the answer. But then there are also just some technology inflection points that have headed at us that now make things more realizable than they were three years, five years, five years ago. So technology is always advancing. And so part of it is, you know, just taking these various inflection points where now the timing is right. Do you get much pushback when you say Moore's Law is breaking down? Uh, you know, not much pushback in terms of those that I, I think really kind of follow it at that level of detail. And by no means am I, you know, taking shots at, you know, the Intels or the AMDs of the world. But because it's a revolutionary statement. It is. You know, just it is. Say. And, I mean, it's amazing the things that they've done over the years to even keep that orange curve That's moving right. up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if they're intellectually honest about it, they, they see it as well, mm -hmm. right? Who can remember, you know, even your own home PC, remember when it was all about, oh, I've got to have the fastest, you know, megahertz processor, right? right. And so we chased and chased and chased that until we really kind of capped out on, on what we could do. Well, then what did we start doing to, again, keep Moore's Law going? Well, let's just take the core uh, that we got working at max speed, and let's just now stamp out multiple ones of those. Mm -hmm. And so let's turn it now into more of a software problem to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so that's then how we kept Moore's Law yeah. alive in that spirit. Uh, but now we're getting to the point where, you know, we can't make the transistors much smaller. Uh, we can't pack them in any tighter because the power density is, has reached a level we can't deal with. So... Again, if they're honest about it, they would probably say we need to start looking outside of the processor now for ways to keep the performance moving ahead, and that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, excellent. Mr. Wheeler, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a great presentation. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs>